Far away, I could hear my mammy's voice singing. My palms were sore from small hard biscuit crumbs on our kitchen floor digging into the skin, but my legs still leaned against the wall. I liked doing handstands. I loved the world upside down. It made me dizzy, but I liked that feeling. The ceiling was marked with grease and smoke stains. The washing hanging from the ceiling pulley looked like ghosts were wearing the clothes. Woolly hand knitted jumpers stood straight up with their arms outstretched, but they had no hands or heads. Maybe my secrets and sore bits would disappear if I were to stay like this. My big sister Anne pinched me on the knee. Janie, turn the right way up, eh? Not yet. Sometimes I would only talk upside down. Sometimes I would talk in code only I knew. Sometimes out in the street, I would kneel down and scoop puddle water in with my hands because I was thirsty, but too scared to go home and face what was there. My first memory is being about four or five years old and standing outside our small first floor flat in the east end of Glasgow laughing. I was the only one laughing. Everyone around me was crying. Our first dog was being taken away to be killed by the vet. I was laughing with happiness because I had an ice cream. No one ever bothered to ask why I laughed at strange times. I had two elder brothers, Midge and Vid, and one elder sister, Anne. I was the youngest, so I was allowed to be daft. When I was about seven years old, I laughed when I realised the words real fun at an anagram of funeral. The six of us lived in the small two-bedroom flat at the corner of Kenmore Street in the middle level of a three-storey greystone building in the heart of an industrial area called Shettleston, whose only claim to fame was it was the least healthy place to live in the whole of Scotland. An average man's life expectancy was 10 years less if he'd been born and remained in Shettleston. The area was a mixture of big brown tenements and grey stone buildings, all mostly ingrained with a layer of black soot at that time the 1960s. It takes us right back there, mm. um, which obviously it must have done for you writing it, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. Tell me a wee bit about your mum and your dad, because your mum, it seems to me, really knew what storytelling was. Yeah, Annie was definitely a character. She was this thin whip of a woman. She would dance to Hollywood films, and she had dreams of the everyday housewife that never came true. Mm. But in real life, she was traumatised, I think. She, she was always in debt. She was always telling lies and, don't tell your daddy, mm. don't tell your daddy. Um, and the house was really dirty a lot of the times. And when anybody ever said, oh, God, your house is a bit dirty, my mummy would say, Myra Hindley keeps her curtains clean. So she had a very dark sense of humour. Um, she never thought having a dirty house was a bad thing when people had clean houses but hurt kids. Mm. But she also knew that I was being hurt as well, but she hid it deep inside her. She ended up in a mental hospital a few times. That's what it was called then. Mm. Um, she had epilepsy and fell about a few times. Once in front of me, she put her feet in the fire and almost burnt to death. She was quite a drama, was Annie. I mean, I'm making it sound funny, but mm. she had a very tragic life. But she always had big dreams. I want to talk more about your mum later because I, I found I felt by the end of the book like I really like I really knew her, mm. um, and I think that's one of the one of the great successes of it. Tell us about your dad. What, what, you say your mum said, "Don't tell your dad." Why? What, what would he have done? I mean, I had a very good dad. I mean, my dad was the man that fixed the radiograms. He fixed the televisions of everybody. He was very good with his hands. He was a functioning alcoholic. I never knew my dad was an alcoholic until he told me he was an alcoholic. He held down a job, he worked, he, um, he loved my mommy. The two of them were crazy together, but he wasn't like the violent father that punched you all about the house and the kids all ran down the street screaming. And... Mm. But him and my mum had, I think she had created that many lies about the money. I don't know what she did with the money. Mm. You know, they should have been okay. But I think she was a gambler, you know, and I remember being in the, I remember being in this shop and I could look down and there was cigarette ends and I was dark, so I was under her coat mm. and I could hear the no, 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 market, no, no, and it was the horses. So she's obviously got me in a bookie, mm -hmm. bookie shop. So her and him loved each other. They used to kiss and I'd try and separate them, you know. Um, I think that she just never got to live the life she wanted. Mm. Um, and like many women back then, if they had emotional problems, 
you know, they weren't allowed a nervous breakdown because she had four kids and the fair was coming up, so she had to put that in the back burner. Mm. Um, and she just lived her life on Valium and Mandrax and Phenobarbital. I can still remember the names of all the tablets. To this day, I still have a problem trying to swallow a tablet because it reminds me of her taking tablets all the time.